Committee of the whole meeting, roll call please. Member Castellano? Present. Member Coppola? Present. Member Dugan? Present. Member Gately? Present. Member Magnolia? Present. Member Pena? Present. Mayor Nicholson? Present. We are here for the interview for legal services and the final candidate that we are interviewing is going to be joining us shortly. Hello. 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 Good evening. Good evening. Welcome and thank you for uh, coming and for your interest in this position. I'm Jared Nicholson. I'm the mayor and chair of the school committee and uh, we're looking forward to discussing uh, the school committee council position with you this evening. Thank you again for coming. My colleagues on the school committee will each be sharing a question and then at the end uh, of the interview of the questions we'll have time if there's any other thoughts or comments that you'd like to share. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I have the first question for you. Why do you think that you or your firm would be a good fit to provide legal advice and counsel to the school committee of the Lynn Public Schools? Sure. Um, so I'm Tom McEnany. This is my colleague Darren Klein, managing attorney of the firm, Lauren Goldberg. So thank you first for having us here tonight and give us the opportunity to meet with you. So I think we'd be a good, a really good fit. I think we are in a unique position to provide legal services to the school district. For two reasons number one this is really what we do 98 percent of the clients that we have are public sector clients we represent cities and towns uh, school districts housing authorities water and sewer commissions um, water districts and basically any type of local government and ent governmental entity that you can think of we have a depth and wealth of experience dealing with municipal school and other public sector issues. We have a focus on, we do public records, open meeting law, building construction, MSBA, uh, school issues, um, basically anything that you will come across. And that provides us in, in, a, in a really unique position for a couple of reasons. Number one is that uh, we can really eliminate the need for you to ever go to outside counsel, um, which is often costly and expensive. Um, because we have expertise in-house. We have 46 attorneys at the firm. Most of them have been with us for a long time and are senior level attorneys. They cover all areas. We have experts in labor and employment, contracts, procurement, school issues, um, general municipal governance type issues, municipal finance, um, MSBA, um, data security issues, COVID-19, uh, basically anything that you would kind of come across real estate land use um, any really uh, pretty much every aspect of, of law that that touches in, upon the public sector um, and that will not only provide you with the ability to stay in-house to avoid those outside legal costs that are often quite expensive it also allows you to um, draw on the breadth and depth of experience of the expertise that we have. Um, we deal with municipalities of all sizes uh, all across the state from um, Nantucket, from, as we often say, from uh, Williamstown to Provincetown. We represent uh, cities, towns, school districts, and other municipal and public sector, public sector entities in every county in the Commonwealth. And well, we're the only firm that can say that. And what really makes us unique here uh, with respect to the Lynn Public Schools is our connection to the community. Um, I was born and raised in Lynn. Uh, I know some of you, prob um, and some of you probably know me or recognize my name. Um, I grew up here. I have a strong connection to the community still. Uh, I live locally. Um, I'm still, I'm a member, of, I'm a board member for the Friendly Nights, uh, which uh, organization, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, I was a former board member for the Lynn YMCA, the Lynn Museum for a number of years. Um, we volunteer as a family at my brother's table a couple times a month doing dinner bags and lunch bags. Um, and so I, I have a strong connection to the community. I understand the city. I know a lot of the players who are involved. 
um, and I understand the challenges and issues that you face. Um, I would be, the way we structure our services is um, we use a primary contact with a backup plan. Um, and so the way we would do, deliver services here for the school department is um, I would serve as the primary contact handling most of the general issues that come in the door, any kind of procurement, public records, open meeting law, those sorts of things. If uh, there's an, uh, some, an, uh, something that I wouldn't typically handle, I would oversee and make sure that it goes to the right person who is best able to provide those services for you. Uh, Darren Klein, who uh, also has strong connections to the city as well, which he'll, he'll tell you about, would serve as the backup attorney and really the primary attorney for labor and employment issues. That's Darren's expertise. He chairs the firm's education and labor and employment practice groups. Um, so he's in a, a great position to be able to provide services here, and I think he, he'll, he can tell you a little bit more about his connections here in so, the city as well. Thank you, Tom, and thank you uh, to, to everyone on, on the school committee and to the mayor uh, for having us tonight. We're, we're honored. Uh, and we really do share a, a, an affinity and a connection uh, to Lynn, which I'll go into in a second. Um, one thing I just wanted to highlight is although we have the breadth of the 45 uh, attorneys that Tom talked about covering each area, we deliver that, those services to you. So you have that big firm depth, but you're not going to deal with 40 attorneys. You're going to deal with Tom and myself and sometimes probably a third attorney. But we bring you this great big firm service, but in a very small firm feel. You will feel like you have a firm of two or three, even though we have 40 people behind us that can cover any area. If it's not an issue that Tom and I know off the top of our head, or you know, in the rare occasion where both of us have conflicts, there'll be a third person, but you're gonna be dealing 90% of the time with, with two, maybe three attorneys. And that's how we really pride the way we provide our services. I also have uh, a lot of connections uh, in Lynn as well. Um, my wife's uh, family is from Lynn, um, and my, uh, my father-in-law owned Paramount Drug, which existed here for about 40 years. And my wife's uh, grandfather started Brotherhood Credit Union, which I'm very proud to say I've been on the board of directors for for about 20 years. And Brotherhood Credit Union has been in the city for uh, probably, uh, I think, close to 90 years. Um, I've been told by many uh, citizens in Lynn that my uh, wife's other grandfather, uh, uh, Dr. Morris Kreplick, delivered a, a baby, at least one member of just about every family in this city was delivered. <laughs> <laughs> So we really have a lot of pride in Lynn. I know uh, I, uh, I also serve on the um, Anti-Defamation League uh, North Shore uh, Advisory Committee, and I've co-chaired um, about the last 20 years the Law and Education Day. Um, I always invite as my own uh, personal guests the, the mayor from the city, the police chief, and the school superintendent, and they have taken me up on those invitations before. Um, even as a, as a member of the board, of directors for Brotherhood Credit Union, you know we're we're involved in Girls Inc. and Lynn, and we um, also uh, uh, provide uh, contributions each year to the Mass Housing Coalition to help pay heat bills for 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 certain citizens in Lynn who who need some assistance. So we take a lot of pride in, uh, uh, you know, I know I've always feel uh, uh, very much a kinship with Lynn, you know, through my wife and her family. And, and, you know, one thing Tom didn't mention is both of us live less than 10 minutes, 10 minutes from, from Lynn. Uh, I've lived in uh, Salem or Marblehead since 1995. Tom, is, as he said, uh, was born and bred in Lynn and now lives in Danvers. So we are a very short phone call and drive away uh, in an emergency, um, you know, when, when those arise. And they do arise sometimes. And, and, you know, we not only know that, but we appreciate it. And that's why... We really enjoy representing school districts, cities, and towns because it's the nature of the business that we like, and we want we want you to feel like you have your own in-house attorney, even though we're part of a much bigger firm. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Um, I'll be asking the second question. Can you tell us about your firm's experience providing legal services to um, school um, committees? in urban uh, school district and municipalities comparable to Lynn? Can you be specific? You know, we have a very, very large Latino community. We have overcrowding issues. 
and we you know we have some challenging and unique issues that are coming up you have any experience with that so we represent um, as far as sort of on the uh, comparable sort of size uh, we represent a, a number of cities and a number of housing authorities in uh, in in, in um, uh, comparable to Lynn we do uh, work we have been city solicitor in Lemonster for 40 years 30 years a, a very long time we represent uh, we do work for New Bedford Fall River okay. um, we do work for Lowell I've been hired uh, by the Lowell schools as special counsel for certain uh, teacher negotiations that got very complicated um, we represent uh, I'm trying to think some other similar communities Thanks, Oh, City of Everett. I'm sorry. We do we do a lot of work for City of Everett as well. We we, we also represent um, housing authorities, which have a lot of similar issues to, to you know in those in those in those cities as well. Separately from doing the work for the city, um, as far as school districts, they 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 do face you know a lot of different issues than uh, than than the city of Lynn. But I've been school council in Swampscott for the past 10 years. I've been school council in Burlington uh, for the past 20 years. I've uh, I've represented, I, I mentioned Lowell schools earlier, but I've done uh, uh, work, uh, I was council um, a while back for Stoughton schools and Seekonk schools as well. So, you know, one of the things we do understand um, that Lynn has its own uh, unique set of issues and you know it's one of the things we really enjoy about what we do is although there are similar issues uh, may maybe every school district faces a lot of the same issues but every school district is so unique and that's why we represent communities of every size and shape and it's one of the things i think that really you know gets us up in the morning gets us excited about what we do because we may know the issues but how that applies uh, in the city of Lynn is going to be very different and it's something that we find very exciting and you know we always say that we are not the policy makers that is all of, of you and you've been elected to do that we want to help you accomplish your policies and accomplish your vision and your mission and it's it's really why you, you know every one of us could be representing private companies right now and they pay more, to be honest, but we've all chosen to stay doing what we're doing because of the passion we have for it. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. I, I have the third question. Right. Could you describe your firm's experience providing legal services related to personnel, labor relations, and collective bargaining in public education? Can you just go a little bit deeper? I know you mentioned earlier sure. uh, some of the personnel. Um, and specifically, if you could talk about some of the union relationships that you've had over the years and mm -hmm. contract negotiations experiences, it would be really helpful to see that sure. insight. So uh, you're going to be very tired of hearing me speak <laughs> soon. But um, so I, uh, Tom mentioned, I chair our uh, not only our, our, our education law group, but our labor and employment group as well. So I've been uh, practicing labor law, uh, public sector labor law in the Commonwealth since 1995. Um, I started working for a union, asked me for about two and a half years, um, have been representing uh, empl public employers for the past 25. I will say the two and a half years I spent with the union seems like it was as long as the 25 <laughs> years I spent representing uh, 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 municipal, uh, public employers, but it was so valuable. Uh, and I, I'll say that like, I, I don't regret, a, uh, I value every day I spent representing the, un the unions because one is I really got to learn and appreciate sort of how unions think, what their priorities are, some of the things they do really well and some of the things that maybe they don't do as well. But it really taught me too about the importance of labor relations. It's such a different area than some of the other things that we deal with. Like, you know, if there's a, a lawsuit for negligence, you know, you, you settle the case or you go to, go to trial and the case is over and the parties never see each other again. That's not how labor relations and personnel and collective bargaining works. No matter what happens, no matter how rocky the road gets or how collaborative the effort can be, we are waking up the next day and working with each other. And it's so important. And I think working on both sides has really allowed me to see that dynamic and appreciate and understand, you know, in, in, in shape sort of how you deal with each situation. Um, as far as, our, as the, the breadth of experience we have, uh, you know, I, I, I can say I'm not sure there's a firm that, that, that represents 
more public entities in labor and employment than us in the state. I mean, we have done everything. I've, I've negotiated personally, you know, hundreds and hundreds of collective bargaining agreements, every type of, uh, of unit. Um, for Swampscott and Burlington, I've been involved in probably the last, well, for Burlington, the last 20 years, uh, teacher negotiations and all the other contracts in between. Same thing uh, in, in Swampscott for the last nine or 10 years, previously in Stoughton. As I said, I was brought in uh, to Lowell teacher negotiations uh, previously as sort of a special counsel in addition to their, uh, their own in-house uh, attorney. Um, they had a very unique health insurance issue that I was sort of brought in for that, that reason. Um, I have experience both in collaborative bargaining and in traditional bargaining. And, um, you know, often, often both are used. I mean, even, you know, I always say that the collaborative bargaining is so important um, and such a useful tool to sort of really establish that rapport and partnership with the teachers. But you do sort of get to that point once, once a, a lot of the the, the 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 sort of the the background issues are are worked on it still often comes down to a couple of maybe more sensitive issues and financial issues and you know often it has to switch to a little bit more of a traditional model um, we really believe uh, that obviously um, you know I think that the style of our firm is we like to consider ourselves very proactive and preventative we would much rather you call with, with an issue, especially on the personnel side, where we can, you know, talk to you for a half an hour and hopefully save you 200 hours of work down the road that is expensive. And we understand mm -hmm. you have a limited budget. You know, we understand the fiduciary responsibility you have all to all your taxpayers, um, but also the emotion that, especially labor and personnel issues involved when it goes to litigation. I mean, you know, it's stressful. So we'd rather save you from all that. But when that doesn't work. We have tons of experience zealously litigating on behalf of our clients. We've done every type of arbitration there is. We've appeared in front of every administrative agency in, in every court, uh, you know, including especially on just about every type of, of school issue. Um, so there's really nothing on the labor and personnel side uh, that we haven't handled. I know that I've really um, uh, been involved too with with a number of our districts, you know, trying to really promote a, a diverse uh, working environment and in, in, in a diverse sort of workforce, um, because all the obvious advantages that has for 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 the way that you know cities, towns, and school districts provide their services, but it's especially beneficial to the students as well. It's just very important, and so I've helped our districts, uh, you know, have policies that help promote and maintain. Uh, and continue to look at new, d new ways as our world becomes more diverse. It involves more, more ways we try to, to have a diverse work, workforce as well. So I, I hope I've touched on everything from the labor and employment <laughs> side of things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Could you describe your firm's experience providing legal services related to special education, student discipline and general school law issues. Mm. Sure, um, I'll let Darren answer the questions with respect to uh, some of the specific experiences that we have. We, we do some of that. However, uh, you may note uh, in our proposal, what we are planning to do, if, if you were to retain us to, to represent the district, is to continue with your current special education counsel, Katie Meinold. So, We've uh, had several conversations with her, uh, and she would. She's from from what we understand has a really good working relationship with the school department. She's a really well, highly regarded lawyer in this area, and so our proposal would be to continue partnering with Katie to provide those services, particularly for the more complicated issues. So. Uh as far as you know, a lot of the general school law issues. I mean, we obviously have experience in, in every area. You know, I've worked on, and our firm has worked on many student privacy issues. You know, this is where I think our background in sort of general municipal law is, is so helpful, and I, I feel like it's a real advantage we have over our competitors and some of the services that schools use because there there are issues which i think have traditionally been considered sort of municipal issues but they play into school districts all the time obviously tom touched on school construction but uh privacy and data breach issues right now are so critical 
uh, public records request, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of entities, you know, really trying to I would say inundate school districts with you know massive public records requests. We've had more public record requests than any firm in, in this Commonwealth. Uh, conflict of interest. I think you know one that's not talked about is municipal finance. It's so important you know one thing we have such an experience and understanding of how the municipal side of government and how the school side of government have to interact especially on, on budgetary and financial issues so we see that whole picture and it does play it doesn't play into every school issue but it plays into a lot of school issues um i have been very involved in more than i'd like to 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 remember uh, student discipline issues at every level obviously that's a whole different type of sensitivity uh, that is, is very different um, than employment issues, but, but, uh, but you know, I think uh, very, very unique in its own way, but we've handled, um, you know, every, every type of student disciplinary issue. Um, and as we talked about, we're very, very sensitive to student privacy rights too, and how that plays, plays in, in, into, um, you know, the, the, the way every, the way that schools are run. Um, as Tom said, we do handle a, a number of, uh, we do handle and have experience in special education. Um, you know, one thing we didn't really touch on is, you know, we've talked about where some of the places where we've been separately appointed as school council, but we handle school law questions every day from our municipal clients as well. And in fact, in many of the small cities and towns that we represent, they don't always have separate school council, or at least that's available to them you know, maybe the budget's used up or, or whatever the case may be. So we get a lot of questions in, in those for, from a lot of our smaller clients as well. We also represent a number of insurance companies who represent most of the cities and towns and school districts in this state. So we get a lot of this, the uh, litigation for school districts through those insurance council, as insurance council actually. And a number of those cases have a number of special education issues as well. So we are versed in special education. But we do, we, we do, um, uh, you know, we do see the best way to handle your most complicated issues is to kind of continue to use that firm who, you know, we're partnering with as part of this proposal. And uh, just one last thing that I did want to add as well is that in terms of the litigation work, um, one of the attorneys who's referenced in the proposal is Deborah Ecker, who's a senior litigator and uh, shareholder at the firm. She is well experienced with respect to civil rights, tort litigation, employment litigation. And um, if you recognize her name, perhaps uh, it's because she was recently hired by the school department for the purposes of handling an investigation for Lynn Public Schools. So she's also very familiar with, with you and, and with, the, with the district. Yeah. And just one other thing I, I just want to touch on real quick is in sort of a combination of the last two questions. You know, one thing too that you know, we really appreciate, although we've negotiated hundreds and hundreds of contracts, there clearly is a very, some unique issues that especially your teachers and administrators negotiations face. And I, I always say, you know, what's very unique is um, teachers absolutely deserve and administrators absolutely deserve the respect of being treated as professionals because they are very professional and they've spent lots of their own money in education becoming professional and then you know, serving your students in such a, a terrific manner. Yet the collective bargaining process has a lot of sort of traditional labor benefits. And that's always a real sort of, I'd say, conflict that's very unique in teacher negotiations and school administrator negotiations is we're dealing with very professional employees, but they have a contract that has a lot of traditional labor benefits. And that just creates a, a very unique tug of war that you have to be very sensitive to. And I, and I also think, and I've spoken on this before, I think one of the major issues facing every community and a major obstacle going forward that we really need to spend a lot of time, you know, sort of figuring out is the teacher's pay scale because, uh, you know, when you add in sort of the steps and the lanes and the historical increases and in the advance in degrees, you know, t very often the increases are far beyond the two and a half percent um, the two and a half percent that most cities and towns are limited in what they can go up on their budget every year. So with 70 or percent of uh, an average city or town's workforce being teachers, how are we supporting and how are we going to continue to fund these increases that usually cost 
more than two and a half percent in a prop two and a half world. And I, I think it it just creates a very real conversation. And I always say, like, you know, I know a lot of the teachers unions, they don't like to necessarily recognize that the step increases have real costs too. But I, I always say we have to talk about the total costs. Nobody's saying that teachers absolutely deserve what they have made, but we have to make it work in a prop two and a half world. And it's a real conversation. I think you have to talk real dollars and, and, and you know, I'm very honest about it and upfront about it. So I'm not sure if that answers this question or the one before, but I wanted to kind of bring that up. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, so my question, with your very thorough answer to the first question you sort of answered, um, which was having multiple staff representatives working with the same client. And you mentioned Tom Darren and Lauren would be our three primary contacts. So beyond the primary contacts, would be anyone from your 46 staff that we would be interfacing with? Sure, there, there would certainly could be times when that would be the case. I mean, the way we set up our practice is basically, we want you to feel like you have a small firm experience where you have, uh, it's basically going to be Darren, myself, and probably Deb Ecker would be one of the other attorneys who's involved on a regular basis with this <coughs> department. Um, but you, to the extent that a, a specialized question came up, for example, if, if something came up with respect to a real estate transaction for, um, or if there was a zoning issue related to where you were going to look to site the, the new Pickering Middle School, for example, we would bring in one of our experts in that area. So it may be a situation where for that particular issue, you would be dealing with a different attorney. But um, and, and that's the what we really bring to the table, I think, is, is as a firm, is that we have that expertise across the board. So it's not a situation where you'd have to go out and hire a special counsel to handle that particular issue. But for the most part, on any kind of day-to-day -day, um, operational type questions or anything that came up, you would be dealing with either me, Darren, or probably Deb. Would be okay. Tom, if I could just sure. jump in for one sec. Um, Lauren Goldberg, I'm the managing attorney at KP Law, and I'm very glad to be here tonight. Um, obviously, I don't need to say very much because these guys <laughs> have, have <laughs> quite a lot to say. But I, I do want to point out that you know the, the fact that you – it isn't that we want you to feel like you're working with a, with a small firm. You are working with your counsel. And you don't have to remember everybody else is, who's working on a case or if there's you know, some, someone you talk to about a particular issue. You just remember Tom and Darren, and you can call them, and they will figure out who they need to talk to and what they need to get you know, back to you in a time that's, that's, um, that's quick enough you know, to, to satisfy you. And again, again with the, with the bench, um, it's not as though Tom and Darren or I know all the things about everything. I think we can agree that municipal law, including school law, has gotten more and more complicated. Mm -hmm. And so one of the benefits of the firm is while we're all general municipalists or you know, general public sector lawyers, we each have that area of expertise. But that's, that's behind the scenes. You guys never have to worry about that. If there's an issue that comes up that, um, you know, that Tom or Darren thinks is you know, really best handled by a data protection specialist, he will go and talk to her and you know, bring you back the information you need. And if you want more, then we kind of leverage her knowledge and, and her um, abilities to your advantage. So. And the only thing I would add is, is we don't hide the rest of the firm from you, too. Like, you know, the <laughs> superintendent may say, well, Darren, I appreciate you kind of playing intermediary, but I would like to talk to uh, Janelle Austin as somebody who does tons of public records and data privacy issues. And the superintendent may say, you know, I think I'm, I want to just call Janelle directly. And that's fine, too. It's not like you – we try to bring it all to you through Tom and I, but it doesn't mean we limit you. If there's another attorney that you click with or for certain issues you really enjoy dealing with and you want to deal directly, we, we, are, we, are, we absolutely offer that type of flexibility that, that that works as well, too. So we kind of let you go at your own speed. You know, we, we will be here to, to, to sort of do 90 percent of the work and you'll be dealing with us. But if there's somebody else you like on a particular issue and you want to deal with that attorney directly, absolutely. And uh, just as a little follow-up, would, would anyone be assigned to uh, uh, attend the Lynn Public School Committee meetings? 
sure that's a, if that if my understanding is that was part of the service that you were looking for mm -hmm. so yeah we would have somebody attend one of the meetings and I think what we would probably do in advance is try to we would review the agenda obviously with either the superintendent or the mayor um, and see who would be the best person to, to attend that meeting if there was going to be a lot of discussions about labor and employment type of issues Darren would probably be the best person to go if it was something that was more public construction related uh, or MSBA that would be me um, so you know but we would certainly be able to arrange for coverage um, you know for any meetings that you mm -hmm. wanted us to attend that's, that's something we're used to um, you know a lot of us do well, anybody who really does any kind of municipal or public sector work understands that most boards and committees are staffed by people who have a day job and so they're volunteers giving their time to the community and so oftentimes the meetings are in the evenings and so it's it's something we're certainly used to handling and I just mentioned quickly the third attorney we have in the proposal is Deb, Deb Ecker who's already done work with Lynn schools and uh, you know recently was involved in an investigation and uh, you know really enjoyed working with the city and you know as I said Tom and I are less than 10 minutes away Deborah is probably 20 minutes away 25 minutes away so you know, we, 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 we did that intentionally to try to give you as approximate attorneys as, as we, can, we could that, that, you know, can really fill out everything you need. Okay, great. And uh, thank you for coming tonight. Good evening. Um, my question is sort of different than the rest, but it's an example. Um, so if a school committee member received a constituent call alleging that a particular school was acting in violation of Lynn Public School policy. And the planned action was scheduled for the following day. How would you handle that? So I, I think the, the, well, obviously I would get all the information I could for, from you. Uh, I would then say the, the, the first, the next two calls that I would need to make would be to the superintendent, obviously, and to the, the mayor as the school committee chair. Um, I'd want to go through sort of, you know, the urgency of the issue. Are we dealing with a safety issue, which obviously uh, anytime student, safety of students or employees is involved, it's something we need to handle immediately and obviously has a whole different sen set of urgency. Um, and then we would, we, Obviously, the next call would be to the principal of that building, and we would obviously try to to resolve the situation. And if, after talking, you know, with the superintendent and the mayor and the principal, we did feel that it was a violation of, of like you said, the district policies, you know, we certainly would recommend that the the action not be taken, or try to find a way to bring bring it within the school district policy so you know it's I'm trying to deal with the hypothetical yeah. but it's assuming the event if it is an event could take place but it maybe just needed to be modified slightly to comply that would obviously be the goal but if it was clearly in violation you know we would talk about obviously putting putting that that event off and I think if, if sure. I could Absolutely. Um, I think it's important to recognize that we understand that you all have emergencies we, we don't as, as Tom was saying, we work at night, we work on the weekend, we get calls at, you know, on Saturday morning while we're watching soccer or whatever it might be, much to our family chagrin. Um, but we are constantly um, handling crises. And so, uh, especially in the, the labor and employment world or when we're dealing with children um, or other, um, other sensitive uh, constituencies, our, our number one job is to make sure that no one's going to be injured, hurt, et cetera. And then after that, again, it's you, you guys uh, as a whole, the school committee is a decision maker. Um, you know, we don't, we don't, we're not the police. We don't tell you what you have to do, except once in a while, Darren does tell you what you have to do. Um, but most of the time, we just want to bring the information to you, identify what the decision points are, and then support you in making those decisions. And then once that decision is made, we will defend that decision as zealously as we can. Um, it, it's, uh, it's very common for us to get calls from one person or another person on a board or committee, and each time we come back to, this is the school committee, or this is the, you know, the, the board of selectmen, or 
it's or the city council it's not individuals so we can get that information but we vet that the appropriate way through the you know through the chair and through the superintendent immediately um, we don't want to do anything that you all wouldn't want to have wouldn't want us to do and oftentimes you know if there's a, a real emergency we'll wind up having a meeting to bring everyone up to date and try to figure out uh, what the next steps are thank you wonderful well thank you so much uh just wanted to offer you an opportunity if there's any other uh thoughts or comments you wanted to share um the only thing that i just wanted to add again and thank you for giving us the opportunity to meet with you this evening is that uh, the one thing that we didn't really touch on is some of the other things that we do as far as kind of proactive and preventative law that's really the focus uh, of the firm and it's something that we really believe strongly in and that's to you know try to um, make sure, try to give you advice that's preventative in nature to avoid incurring costs and the time and heartache associated with litigation um, and in, in some of the other ways that we do that are we offer um, to all of our clients we offer two free seminars a year on a variety of different topics we cover the open meeting law public records how to have a public hearing um, disciplinary issues for employees things like that which um, you know we would offer offer to you as well we also put out e-updates periodically on a variety of different topics most recently uh, the focus has been primarily on the COVID-19 pandemic as you can imagine um, related to different issues with respect to mask mandates vaccination and some of the employment issues that go along with that so that's another service that we do offer that uh, we think is a real benefit to our clients but other than that just thank you for having us this evening thank you very much thank you very much thank you so much thank you thank you thank you, thank you. thanks for coming So, members, if you if so, we would take a motion to adjourn this committee hall meeting. Make a motion to adjourn. Second. Roll call, please. Member Castellanos? Yes. Member Coppola? Yes. Member Dugan? Yes. Member Daly? Yes. Member Magnolia? Yes. Member Pena? Yes. Mayor Nicholson? Yes. All right, adjourned. committee the sessions are not designed to encourage debate or lengthy exchange of views but are to have the committee understand numerous points of view the committee would appreciate speakers keeping their presentation to three minutes in order to accommodate as many people as time permits the chair reserves the right to limit the number of speakers on the same topic to three all speakers must be at least 18 of years of age or enrolled in the high school in the Lynn public school district having discussed their views with a student government representative the chair reserves the right to rule the speaker out of order if he or she feels that the speaker's comments are personal in nature, if the speaker's comments are directed at a school committee member or a member of the school administration in attendance, that member through the chair may address the individual. The sessions will promptly commence 15 minutes prior to the start of the regular school committee meeting. There is a sheet uh, in the table here for anyone interested to speak at our open mic session. Thank you.
Thank you. All right, so uh, we will begin with um, Paul Renzi. Just want to start by uh, reminding uh, anyone that, that's sharing that while we encourage and welcome the sharing uh, on, on policy matters, we, we, the personnel issues are not uh, appropriate topics uh, for a public forum like this. Um, so uh, just just wanted to, to start start there for pers for personnel matters. Okay. okay. Um, so I and, mean, in, in regards to the subject that I had on there, is that is this not the forum to discuss that at this point? Or? Right. If, if if you're talking about specific individuals, it's just not the because it's a it, this is a public meeting. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, if you, if you ha have thoughts about the general philosophy or, or policy issues, um, then. Uh, okay. Well, I, I guess I could touch on that then with, without touching on uh, individuals. Can you just give me one more? Yeah, of course. Yeah, and the, and the other thing um, that the, the superintendent mentioned, which I think is a great point, is that he's he's happy to uh, offer a forum for people to talk that would did not be in the public meeting. So if you want to sit down with Dr. Tutwiler and share specific uh, thoughts and feedback about, about a a personnel. If it's for the benefit of our children, why cannot we not ask all of you guys to have to do with the same thing? So I'll run down the list. We're I'll not here to fight <clears throat> argue. We're just here to put our concerns in the table. Right. Yeah. So so I'll run down the list. Um, but uh, this is supposed to be uh, Topics that are before the school committee, you know, so so policy matters at the district level, and uh, the personnel matters is just not the appropriate form because you're you, because by by definition you're having to name individual people. That's not to say that they aren't valid and important concerns. It's just finding the right place to share those. Thank you. Um, so uh, that that being said, if you could state your name um, and address, uh, and then you know we you, we can we can try to uh, figure it out as we go. If you'd okay. like to, okay. No problem. Uh, my name is Paul Lindsay. I live at 16 Addison Ave here in Lynn. Um, I guess you know to to not get individualized with this. Um, the idea of uh, athletic coaches. Um, I know there are some openings that may have just come up. Um, I, I would think that the city as a whole would look at those position, uh, those um, coaches that they're looking to hire an applicant and consider people who are extremely invested in the city of Lynn, um, who have given a lot of time, have lived here, um, have done a good job. I, I recently did coach um, in the city uh, football. Um, and so when looking at candidates for those positions or to replace um, those positions that, you know, we would put the, the good of the youth and the good of the kids forward before any kind of politics or anything, um, you know, that, that may run onto that. Um, I, I, I guess that would kind of, you know, lead me, I, I guess my other question would be, you know, how, how could I get in touch with you, superintendent, so that we could have, you know, an actual conversation about, you know, some of the issues. Uh, once we're done with this, before we start the meeting, okay. I'll come over. And Fair enough. Back. Thank you. That's all set for now. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Lindsay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Lizna Santiago. First of all, I've never done this, so I don't even know what I have to do. But my name is Lizna Santiago. I live on 20 and a half New Park Street. I have a high school junior. I love English High School. I just heard via Facebook media that my coach, my, son, my son's coach position is open. He's only been with us for six months. I understand this, so some regulations, what so forth, what some not. Um, I heard everybody's position that gave me a call today. Brian, Lenny, I apologize for whatever I posted earlier. Brian, thanks for getting back to me. Thanks for explaining and thanks for caring. I am here caring for my student, for my child that that coach took out of that basketball court when he was with the wrong people and put him on that field and put him on them books. I'm here for other parents that also have emailed Dr. Brega, 
whatever his name is, because I've only seen a picture. I've never even had an introduction with the guy for him to decide over a coach or to post a position that a coach has been holding, making a life in this kid's life. I've not seen my son in the book so much since this coach has stepped in the game. My son would not come to me to trust me or tell my mom I love you, okay, since he went out into high school. I never seen the son I had into Coach Mac Charles McKenzie stepped on that field. And I appreciate if that position could get taken off that posting and he could be kept for at least another year. My son has changed coach twice since he's been a Lynn English and Lynn Public Schools actually has failed me once with my autistic son. And if it wouldn't be because of Brian Castellanos and Michael Satterwhite, I would have not headed the right direction to get my son's needs. So I am here to beg as a needed parent and appreciate if anybody would hear me and take this into consideration because all other parents want to be here today and they are unable to make it here today. But we will fight and we will be into this. I have a petition that has about almost 200 people signed for it because we all want him to stay. So I would hope this gets taken into consideration. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you Ms. Santiago. Uh, Mr. Beret. Bercy. Bercy, sorry. <laughs> I'm Alan Bercy. I live in 62 Curran Road. Um, I, I mean, I agree with everything that uh, both both of the, the previous people um, said. And, the biggest thing is um, the assessment. Uh, assessment of a coach cannot be six months. It just doesn't, it, it doesn't jive that after six months of coaching football, that somebody can be possibly re replaced. I don't think it's long enough uh, for somebody to prove what they can do. Um, so, I mean, that's the only thing that kind of uh, it's 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 kind of strange in this situation uh, that after six months I've coached 13 years, um, so I know how much work it takes to succeed, um, especially in Lynn with five uh, high schools. We have Kip, we have uh, St. Mary's, we have Lynn Tech, um, English, Lynn English, and Lynn Classical. It's very hard to get a a group of talented kids to succeed right away. You need time to build your program to prove that you can do the job that you were um, set out there to do. It cannot be done in six months. Um, a coach's job is year, a year-round job. And so in six months, you can't, uh, prop, I don't think you can properly assess uh, a human um, for giving all that he can for the city especially a person that's already grew up in the city and had already been coaching and knows how to produce and, and do the things that's needed for the young people in our city, stay off the streets and, and to succeed. But six months is just not enough time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Bercy. Thank you. Is there anyone here uh, that would like to speak at open mic? Anyone remaining? Okay, we will close open mic. Thank you. All right, I would like to call to order the second regular meeting of the school committee. Roll call, please. Member Castellanos? Present. Member Coppola? Present. Member Dugan? Present. Member Gately? Present. Member Magnolia? Present. Member Pena? Present. Mayor Nicholson? Present. All right, uh, Pledge of Allegiance, and then we'll remain standing for a moment of silence.
pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'd like to now have a moment of silence for Tracy Lee Burke, food services cook on January 9th, 2022, Timothy Toomey, retired teacher on January 11th, 2022, Frederick Cole, retired assistant superintendent, January 22nd, 2022, and Claire Glowick, retired confidential secretary on January 24th, 2022. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, next item on the agenda is uh, the minutes. Make a motion to accept the first regular meeting with the executive session on January 13, 2022. Second. Second. Roll call, please. Number Castellanos? Yes. Number Capola? Yes. Number Dugan? Yes. Number Yes. Member Magnolia? Yes. Member Pena? Yes. M Mayor Nicholson? Yes. There are no appointments and elections. And next item is the Lynn Community Enrichment Program presentation from Ms. Guzman. Good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see you all. Happy New Year. Yes. Happy New <laughs> Year. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, my name is Michelle Guzman, and I am, would like to uh, let you know a little bit more of the program that I'm running. I'm the coordinator of the uh, Link Community Enrichment Program. Some people might be very familiar with that. Some new faces might not. So that's the other reason why we're here. And uh, here with me is Guadalupe Vélez. Um, um, uh, community outreach. Community <laughs> outreach for, um, um, she is working part-time with uh, New Link Coalition. And so together we are trying to um, reach more of a broadened um, audience. And that's what we're going, we're here for. Uh, let me see. There you go. Okay. So... Um, Lean Community Enrichment Program is a collaboration between uh, Lean Public Schools and New Lean Coalition, uh, which is a nonprofit organization uh, formed with uh, board, lab uh, faith, labor, and community organizations um, in Lynn, union and non union. And um, they are to empower the uh, all sectors of the working, of the working, um, working class. Um, and so one of the ways that they are doing this is um, through education. So on 2015, New Lynn Coalition and other organizations uh, created the Community Benefit Agreement um, that work that was work with the uh, a Boston developer who did the um, lawyer Lower Washington Project, uh, the beautiful green building uh, in front of North Shore Community College. So. Um, uh, the agreement was uh, for them to build this uh, beautiful uh, building, uh, but then they will commit to bring, to Im invest, in invest back to the community uh, with trainings and improve job skills. So that is why um, this is the project that is standing right now. And so um, the funds came from that agreement and um, they they work it out together through the um, uh, through the agreement for bring funds to to us. Um, what I learned from this um, uh, agreement was that uh, the Lower Washington Project was um, is is teaching us um, an important lesson, uh, and that is that how a uh, housing development project can invest in the education of Lynn if the parties involved are. Um, Either parties will work together. So that's one of the ways that how New Link Coalition was born. And so um, LCEP is a nice school for Lynn residents, but we're not limited only to Lynn. Uh, it's for the North Shore. Uh, offers classes for personal growth, also for um, 
improve their job skills like computer classes, uh, but also for leisure. So, for example, one of the things that we're going to promote is a yoga class for teachers. And we are really looking forward that after a very heavy day for teachers, for professionals or staff in the Lane community, in, in the uh, schools, they can go and take a yoga class. Okay, so that's an invitation for everybody, uh, <laughs> men and women. <laughs> so <laughs> we're definitely looking for, uh, for uh, staff to come down and enjoy that um, the the good the beauty of this is that the classes are once a week so it's not like you know we understand our population is for the adults you know with house and then work and careers and kids and everything you know asking them for to come twice a week like it's too much so um, the program runs once a week um, the classes are from six to eight with the exception of yoga because that starts at four so you know if teachers are done at 3 30 they can get dressed and then they can go to um, the yoga classes um, but also um, the program is self-sustained and so what we have from the registrations comes uh, and pays our teachers. So that's another thing that um, we uh, we work together with that and make sure that uh, our teachers are paid, but then the classes meet that small criteria or students. Um, so we're not an additional burden <laughs> to the budget of the Lean Public Schools. Um, so um, right now I'm excited because uh, Lupe is helping me to um, do the outreach, and I'm going to be more concentrated on the expansion and the actual uh, cre um, getting the LCP bigger, uh, and then reach out more people um, in our um, here in Lynn, but, but also in the North Shore. So what I did over here is that there the expansion is actually in two th in two uh, sections. One is when is the regular classes, you know, yoga, ESOL. We also have a conversational Spanish. Uh, one of our teachers is Ms. Rowe from Reed, and um, she does a tremendous job uh, at our school. Um, also, Lisa Lynch teaches yoga, and so uh, we have public speaking too from one of the professors from North Shore Community College. So we have a good variety of classes. Um, this um, session, um, this winter session, we're going to have cooking and hopefully key decorations. So we're really trying to find a little bit of diversity. Uh, but the other thing is that we want to be able to improve some skills. And so that is the other section in this um, display, when is certification ori oriented um, classes. So the first thing that we have is the introduction to oil burner. Um, we are, I'm working on um, get a teacher that is certified for Microsoft Suite. So at the end, that the students take these classes, they will be able to have that certificate. And of course, it look pretty. It looks pretty when you're doing a resume, right? Uh, and the biggest one that we're doing right now is the paraprofessional. Uh, we're creating this class where. Um, whoever is interested to become a paralegal will have that background. Uh, because right now um, we have um, Lean Public Schools, which is um, it, it's um, a testing site. And so we are getting ready to promote it and make it available to people in the North Shore that they're going to be able to um, schedule appointments here in Lynn to be tested. So we will see that progress coming, coming out. Um, here, I introduce you to the LCEP board, the people that um, I report and I work with. Um, the superintendent over, over here is the champion here. <laughs> um, Mr. Ford, uh, he was very nice. He did not continue running, but he wanted to stay with us, and I appreciate that. Um, it's me as the coordinator. And then we have Tish Mokala. She is the president of the New Lynn along with the um, executive director Jeff Crosby and we're gonna we need two more uh, members in our uh, committee uh, on, on, on our board so then we're balanced and then you know we have we bring a little bit more of more of diversity so if anybody is interested I'm gonna be looking for you <laughs> for that and then so the two biggest announcements is that the winter session is gonna start um, after February vacation, February 1st, I mean March, March 1st. <laughs> uh, we're gonna have the registration online 
Uh, we're in the process of updating our website, and we're going to do an in-person sign-up night um, the first two weeks of February. And um, the biggest thing, the second biggest thing, is that we are getting ready for that testing day for our professionals. Uh, we did a test last year, uh, limited. We didn't go out. We just kept it in-house because we just wanted to make sure that we have all the uh, necessary tools for that. And so um, the last one was in November. We got three ladies that um, did the test, but um, only one had passed the test. And so that's the other focus that we want to do, and that's the, prepar the pre preparation class that I want to build. Uh, we already have a curriculum from Lawrence, and so they're doing it there. And so I'm working with them to see if we can bring implement it here for that. Um, and so the other thing is that um, next week, I am sure you guys received my emails. <laughs> uh, we are uh, inviting you guys. Um, this uh, event is called um, Discovering LCP. It's targeted for uh, community leaders and uh, head of departments in local organizations that to let them know about this program and so we can extend a little bit more of what the regular um, audience that we have. So uh, it's welcome. Everybody is welcome here. Um, it's going to be a small gathering, um, obviously following the protocols for COVID, social distancing, but it's going to be um, a short program, but also uh, filling out the stories of the things that we have um, done so far and how, how people has changed uh, when they just take the classes over there. So it's a, it's a resource within the community and definitely we want to expand that to more people. Um, and that's it. Do you guys have any question or comments? Member Dugan. Uh, yes, so thank you. Uh, I'm a graduate of the program, the Conversational Spanish by the Skin of My Teeth, but <laughs> <laughs> I did finish. I did finish. Um, so you, you talked about the power protesting. Um, could you explain a little bit more about that? Because I think that's wonderful um, that you're you know, helping with things like that, but just the test itself, what, uh, oh, the what that entails a little bit. Yes, yes. So the paraprofessional, it's it's a program. Um, so you can be you can get a paraprofessional certificate from the state through two ways. One is through um, uh, I think it's thirty two a uh, college credits, and um, you submit your paperwork, and then that's the validation for a paraprofessional. Uh, but the other one that this is the one that we're doing here is that you take the test is two hours and a half and through the ETS program, which is um, um, the software in the company that is authorized by the state of Massachusetts to be um, to be approved and, and make sure that that everything goes well. And so we um, a make a date and then the, the whoever is interested can take this test. Uh, obviously I do a preparatory class where I do a tutorial. Uh, I explain them what this is going to be and they um, even the website has some uh, resources for them to study and so they take the test and depending on their score that's how you know if they if they pass. And so you know prefer, prefer professionals are um, the teacher's aid, and so that's uh, the difference. Do, great. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does, and thank you very much. Okay. It's a great program. Thank you. Lorraine? Uh, yeah, member Gailey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like so thrilled that you got the test in Lynn. You have worked years to get that test in Lynn, and this just seeing this made my day. I was like, that's awesome that <laughs> Thank that you. happened. This is a great program. Um, people that are like looking for jobs, they don't have a job, you can take intro to oil burner, um, uh, learn Microsoft Suite um, interpretations. Uh, it just, um, and it's not a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, and do you have any kind of vouchers or something? So if someone say they couldn't pay for it, is there anything that they have? At this moment, no. What what I do tell people uh, right now at this time, obviously we're the lowest yep. um, uh, well, pro classes, and I definitely understand. What I do say is that if if this is an investment on you, so if this is six weeks, if you think about it, that you save at least ten dollars a week, 
you can get to that. Yep. But um, we do offer through um, the organization New Link Coalition. Uh, right now, it's limited to their members right now. And it's uh, a little bit, um, I think it's $30 discount for that. But um, it's, uh, it's for their members through through them. Because that was part of that, um, the community benefit agreement that I mentioned. So they work for that. But uh, we're not doing it for the regular, um, like for the general public. Um, that's something that maybe we can explore and find out uh, a way to do some vouchers. I'm very thrilled with this, Michelle. I'm so happy about that Paratess. Yeah. It was like out west something. Yeah, and the closest was Holyoke. Yeah. And very, very far away. Sometimes it was limited to Lawrence, but the the one that consistent was in, in um, Holyoke to go. Bottom so, and, mm -hmm. and the other thing is that it's... it's uh, it, oh, part of the event next week, and that's why I would like you to be there. It's the official announcement through the newspapers and through the social media and the uh, media that Lynn, <laughs> Lynn Public Schools, especially Lynn Tech, is going to be the testing site for that. Mm. It's a great job. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Pena and Mayor Castellanos. Thank you, Michelle. Hey, muchas gracias por venir. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know the I know all the work you put into this, and I really appreciate it. It's, it's a great program. Now, is this on the classes that you offer? Are they on a first time, you know, first come basis? Uh, is there a capacity, or are you people have to register in advance to to? Yeah, so uh, we we have two ways, which is the online, and which is most of of the uh, um, the people that register, and then the other one is uh, through in person. It, there is a limit, but because of the space and and um, the between the classes, it's between twelve and fourteen, up to fourteen students, um, and having that social distancing between. Um, and what 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 else? That's it, right? Yeah, no, that, that was the question with the, with the especially like the yoga class and the yes. other classes. The, the only thing that I want also to point out is that I forgot to mention is that, for example, we are the only program that is giving uh, computer classes in Spanish. And so I'm working out with um, a um, Greenlandia. Um, uh, there is a this person in from us higher that she speaks Spanish, and mm -hmm. so we're trying to see also yeah. from New American Center to see if we can back pathways to, if we can have like a crew coming into Spanish and then learn uh, the basic computers. Also for the seniors, that's something another thing that we're doing. <laughs> and the, and this is open not only to Lynn. You said the North Shore. Exactly for the North Shore. Yeah, okay. yeah. The classes is going uh, going to start March first, but the enrollment is in next week. We're working on it. Mm -hmm. The website, through the website, yes. Thank you. Remember, Cassianos. First of all, thank you so much for coming tonight, and I uh, really appreciate your thorough presentation uh, and all the work that uh, you guys put into this. Uh, it you. does take a lot of work, especially coming, you know, post-pandemic and all the challenges that were presented in front of you and just the resilience that takes. Because uh, these, these programs really change lives, um, and they impact community in really positive ways. Um, and, and I really appreciate the equi equitable access points that you just talked about, you know, having uh, the technology piece transition to our Latino population, which is growing. Very important. Um, I want to kind of just briefly kind of have a conversation around funding. Kind of, can you kind of explain to me a little bit more about what that funding looked like? Is that grant based? Is it through? No. So these, um, the specific um, agreement that we got, uh, we got it through the developer, and um, I think it was fifty thousand dollars last year. But then that was kind of like the takeoff for us, and then now we are sustaining each other. The benefit is that, for example, if one class has low enrollment, but another class is um, has a lot of students, then we balance balance it out. So uh, right now we I have not really have any bad luck of canceling too many classes. For example, the last session was because there was low enrollment. Um, and, but then still we had three three classes. Um, the So right now is based just sustaining by itself, not necessarily that I ha we have extra money from that. But um, I think that looking forward, that's one of the commitments as a coordinator trying to find out uh, how can we bring other programs or work mm -hmm. together, for example, North Shore and Community College, and so work something out? Because I know that um, uh, there is an organization looking for a space, and um, probably our program can do that because they also re they're based in here in Lynn, mm -hmm. and so we might look work something out and then help out more people. 
It's, it's actually what I had written down was partnerships with the Lincoln Community, um, with um, North Shore Community College, and just also just exploring what partnerships are out there, um, the needs out there. I think it's yes. a really it's tremendous um, to hear to to see that you guys are expanding. You know, to look at the certification, um, you know, the paraprofessional piece is really a standout, and I and, and when I see and others to come. I, love, I can't wait to see it, and I, and I was like writing stuff down. <laughs> if I, I always like when I, when I, I think hope is important, right? Yeah. And, I, and and I think trying to trying to vision and vision these these different certifications that can help this community get lifted up, um, and that's how folks are going to go ultimately feed their families and improve their lot in life. And I think giving these opportunities and access um, to our community is vital. Yeah, thank you. And also, I am actually reaching out right now, working with three community leaders and trying to see if they, the way I see it is that if there is a need and then there is uh, people that will be able to teach it, like, for example, organizing one-on-one, -on -one, how the youth can get involved into um, one of the careers, political careers, or something like that. So the, the conversation is there, and then we're looking for venues, how to make it abroad and bring people together. But that's the, the, the mission of, of this program, and especially my to focus on on that bringing the community together thank you. amazing thank you member uh, Capola yeah yeah um, I'm just wondering on the uh, para professional yes, test yes, um, what prep do they get to take the test you know I see that the registration for classes is March 1st so the test is on the 12th is were they in a previous class and now they're testing out on it? So there are two, actually there are two um, a targeted audience on this. One, there are people that are ready to go, that they're going to study on their own and they want to just take the test and have that opportunity. And there is this other group of people that they want to get ready. But based on the curriculum that I got from Lowell, it's actually like six months work. And so... Um, I am trying to see if I do it through the North Shore Community College, if we can incorporate that. I already did that conversation. Faustina Cuevas from the uh, City Hall was very instrumental to make that connection. And so um, that's the way that we are doing it right now. So right now the website uh, offers some sort of um, studies, guide studies, and they will take it on their own. So, But I, I am very clear with the people that are interested that, okay, this is the test. So it's not like you're going to get ready or have a preparatory class that's going to be hopefully in the next session okay so basically now uh, people could access the um the curriculum or whatever you refer to the, to get ready for the test themselves. yes but i have to tell you um i'll be honest with you donna that that i saw the um study guide and doesn't really have a lot of information like um to become a pro professional you have to really know the the grammar the math and, and it's very detailed on on the study so i think that uh, also whoever is already ready like in this case uh, for example people that were study in their countries they can have that valid and they are ready they just have to take the test so that's the other target to work into um, uh, qualifications and um, taking the test okay and um, just referring back to the school department I know that a lot of our para jobs require the associates degree so what would they be working doing if they pass this test uh, are you able to hire them and same thing same thing. Same, yeah. So it's equivalent. So, yeah, it's an equivalent. It's an equivalent. It's an equivalent. So, equivalent. okay. Yeah. Donna, we actually had to break that myth because for some reason communication wasn't there. Um, it was understood that you needed to have certain amount of credits, and that was the only way to become a paraprofessional. But then through our previous work with Rachel and uh, all the other departments within the city and within the Link Public Schools, we were able to differentiate that. That is, it's one or the other. So if you have college credits you can you don't need to take the test you already have that certificate mm -hmm. but the other way is oh, you only have to have high school or your high set and then you take the test and then you can become paraprofessional so yeah that was a that was a myth that was there that if you don't have an associate you're not eligible but yes you are thank you that's the did you have 
Yeah, just just quickly, um, you know, I was going as fast as I can. I didn't want to run uh, when I was setting up the uh, the PowerPoint because I wanted to say something in the beginning. But I'm glad that you just dove right in uh, because you can hear the enthusiasm uh, in Michelle's voice and every phone call that we have, every meeting that we have, that enthusiasm is there and it's really paying incredible dividends in terms of the uh, the polish of the program. It is just growing, it's evolving, and uh, I'm just thrilled to work with you on it. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Yeah, and, and, and I'll just, uh, just want to echo that. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I had the, the privilege of serving on the board uh, for my time on the school committee uh, over the last six years. And, you know, it's a tremendous program with a ton of potential to, to be contributing to the city and, and workforce development, to the individuals to participate, a great opportunity to be building partnerships with really key uh, uh, workforce development partners. And, and uh, you know, I did have to step down and stepping into this role, but would certainly encourage people who are interested um, to, to, to join this team because they're, they're uh, doing great work in the, in the community and in our schools and, and sort of building that bridge. Um, between the community and the school, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. You see. Yeah. So uh, we're just going to take a quick. We're just going to take a quick recess um, before the next agenda on the uh, item. Okay. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Donovan, for joining us this evening. Obviously, we are uh, moving ahead with the Pickering Building Project, and we wanted to share an update with the committee as to where we are in that process and uh, uh, take questions from the, the committee. So, Mr. Donovan, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me here. Uh, Good evening, everybody. In uh, December of 2021, the MSBA approved the city of Lynn to move into the Pickering uh, feasibility study project. Um, the city has been approved for an 1,100 student study. This is versus the previous uh, school study where the Pickering was approved for 652 students mm. and the Westland School for 1,000 students. It was a two school solution. This time it's a one school for 1,100 students. Um, the purpose of the study is to uh, pick a design option for the school, whether it's renovation, renovation in addition, or a new building, um, then go through a schematic design of the building and the site, develop a cost and schedule, and submit it to the MSBA for their uh, approval. Uh, the cost of the study is $1.5 million, and um, upon completion of the study, um, the information that we brought forward to the MSBA um, for their consideration uh, of approval and a schedule. The estimated cost of this project is between 110 and 140 million dollars, depending on the site, the site constraints, and the, um, the layout of the building itself. So the first step in the process is the selection of the owner's project manager, the OPM. Uh, the OPM is the owner's uh, representative in the project. He um, sits with the owner, reviews the schedule from the designers, reviews the design, value engineering, uh, cost estimating, provides the clerk of the works on the job, and acts as the, the, the clerk for the job. There's a lot more that goes into than just being the clerk, but um, all the documentation from the job uh, goes through the OPM. Uh, the MSBA's documentation is very thorough and in-depth, and they're responsible for making sure that the city um, meets the documentation schedules and that the reimbursements are turned in in the proper fashion so that the city gets its reimbursement. They also um, will be the party between the city and the MSBA and negotiations, uh, sitting aside next to the city, on items as to whether they're eligible for reimbursement or not. Sometimes there are gray areas when you get into these projects, and so there's a little bit of uh, room for negotiation. So the school building committee, um, which has been sat down by the mayor, um, I don't have a, the list with me, but I'm sure you've all seen it. Um, their first action will be to form an OPM selection committee. This committee will um, prepare the request for services, the RFS, to go out uh, and procure 
the OPM. This is the city's first action and, and the city's only action that it takes by itself. After um, we procure the OPM, the OPM will be drawing up the RFS for the design as the city will work alongside them. But from that point on, the, the OPM and the design professionals will be on the job. OPM, then we uh, procure the designer, then we start the study. So the, the OPM selection committee will put the RFS out and responses will come in. They'll be ranked. Um, interviews will be held for the top three respondents, and the results will be turned over to the school building uh, committee to make a decision. Um, then it will be presented to the MSBA. The MSBA uh, has the final say in, in the selection of an OPM and a designer, um, but generally when a community picks an OPM and they have the requisite design experience, uh, OPM experience, uh, background in, in the matters at hand, that selection is allowed. So the next step after the RFS for the OPM will be to go out and seek a designer. Um, a request for services will be prepared by the city and the OPM. It'll go out, uh, respondents will be brought back. And at that point, the respondents go to the MSBA's design panel, designer selection panel. It's a 16 member panel. Um, 13 of the people are appointed by the executive director of the MSBA and three people are appointed by the city of Lynn. The representatives from the city of Lynn and the mayor is, are his designee, the superintendent, and a representative from the school committee of their appointee. Um, the respondents to the designer selection RFS will be allowed to make a presentation. Uh, the panel, designer selection panel will score them and then the selection will be made by that panel at that time. Based on the schedule that we've put together, a very rough schedule um, and a very tight schedule, that should happen in May of 2022. Mm -hmm. Once that happens, we will go directly into the feasibility and schematic study. Now, we've been down this road before for this, this site, uh, the school, and Normally, it can take up to 18 months. I've proposed a schedule um, for inclusion, which I'll, I'll be presenting to the, the school building committee. Um, that's a little tighter. It only has a year for that because a lot of the background and legwork have already been done. So part of the process is a site selection. It's one of the most important aspects. We've already explored all the sites that are available in these locations. Um, if there's another site that comes up that becomes available, it's, it's one new one. It's not 10 new ones. Um, the site selection, the sites will just have to be updated. It's the ownership, the, the values of the site, and anything that's changed in the past five or six years. Traffic study, similar. New counts, just updated, but the, the basis of the study is the same. Um, the information on the system, the school system as it is, we have everything. So a lot of the work that's been done should be accepted by the designer um, that we select, that is selected for us, and we move forward with that. So I believe that a year for a feasibility schematic study would be sufficient before we could um, um, get back to the MSBA. That, of course, will depend on the MSBA schedule, whether or not our designer and OPM in the city and the school department are able to get through all the meetings, public meetings, and, and things that are necessary to accomplish this in a, in a visible manner in a year. It could take longer. If it takes longer, it is no harm. It's just going to delay the opening of school a little bit. At the end of the day, with a very tight schedule, I would hope that we could be in the ground in the fall of 2024 for an opening in 2027. Five years is um, a long time, but in the world of building schools, it's just about right to get through the process. So hmm. um, if anybody has any questions, um, I'd be more than happy to answer them if I could. Thank you, Mr. Donovan. Uh, Member Magnolia. 
Thank you very much for this information. Um, how does the reuse of any of our site studies or any of the information that we gathered as part of the last process affect that $1.5 million price tag? I, I know that the pre previous mayor thought that the city might be able to save some money as well as time by reusing some of that information from the last go round. Yes, I, I agree with the, the mayor in that respect. That's why I, rather than 18 months of, of hoping that we can get through this process in 12 months, um, all the background research has been gathered and it, the background doesn't change. We only have to look at what happened, say, between 2017 when we stopped work on this in 2022 to update the sites and whether the site's owned by the same people or not, whether it's been developed since that time. So everything that was done, traffic studies, environmental studies, utility research, it just needs to be looked at quickly to determine has there been a change since 2017. So time is, is money and if, if we don't have to pay the designers to recreate the wheel as it were spending all this time doing research then we will save money on this thank you Mayor Pena. thank you mr donovan i had a question who uh who makes up the committee to uh select the opm how does that how does that um come together who makes that committee up uh the school building committee makes that decision yeah Thank you so much, Mr. Donovan, for coming uh, before us to explain uh, an update. What so in terms of just you know when we sit, we look at 2027, so that's five years, like you said. It seems that's that's where we're at with that. What communication plans do we look like moving forward? What are we going to do to make sure that we're collaborating? What, I know it's not just you; it's a lot of every. It's going to be a very large effort. But what do you, from the last time we did this to now, what would be some of your recommendations for just, some of this is very complex, right? Like what, what you're talking about, it's very, it's, it's what you do. You know, and, but just for our public, what ways can we enhance our outreach? You know, as an elected official, as folks in this room who are here, and when you hear 2027, you can imagine some folks are going, Oh. So, you know, I just want to just, well, let's start with why it's so long. Yeah. So if we work backwards, it, it's going to be two years of construction. <laughs> I mean, when we're talking an 1,100 student um, school, think Thurgood Marshall. It's an 1,100 student school. That's what will be being built. Whether it's three stories or four stories or two will depend on the site. But that's the size and the complexity of the building. Uh, then there'll be a year and a half or a little bit longer of design. Design may be broken up into two packages where we go out after the first 11 months of design and go like we did at Thurgood Marshall into the ground with the site work and the, the foundations and the steel and then bid the rest six months later. Um, two years of design, two years of construction, um, a year for the feasibility, we have five years. Um, some of this is time though also upon the MSBA because we're not the only ones in the, in the state mm. building a school. Mm. So their revenue is derived from the sales tax and they spread it out. So they program, they know what this building is gonna roughly cost and they program it out with all the other communities so that their, their revenues are sufficient to pay for um, their obligations to the communities moving forward. Um, and their review is very thorough of the designs to make sure, well, frankly, that we don't get another classical. It, it's the lesson that we hear all the time at the mm. MSBA. Um, we have the distinction of that. Um, in regards to uh, an open process, I mean, it, 2017 doesn't sound like a long time ago, but look at your phone, um, look at Zoom. I mean, the, the atmosphere we live in these days, it's so much easier to um, push information out, to allow people to speak back. I mean, excuse me. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, meetings can be held that people can't get to. They, the school building committee meetings could be held in a room like this and, and taped and, and, and played. Um, that, that wasn't possible back in 2015 when we started the process. We just didn't do that. I don't know of anybody who did that. Um, social media is there. 
what we did in 2015, the, every, all the meeting and the minutes and studies were posted on the school's website. There's going to be, and I would assume that that's going to happen again. There'll be a website page where people can go. But being able to see something live, to watch discussions like some people may actually be doing tonight, will give people the ability to to see that and, and there's be part of the process as it was. There's, I believe, 22 members of the school building committee and it represents a, a very large different aspects of the community. So I, I think that the plan that's been presented by the mayor with the school building committee is, is of such shape and soundness that good communications should fall out. Everybody's gonna have to do their part, but there's no reason it shouldn't. Uh, and I agree, and, and I just wanted to add, um, you know, when we look at the time frame, you know, these buildings last, you know, these are supposed to, there's a lot that they're, they're meant for durability and, and it takes time to build these, I can imagine. So you know, as we know, we have some buildings that are 100 plus years old that are still standing. So I could imagine with what we're looking at now, the longevity and these uh, capital uh, building plans look like. Great. So just get while you wanted to jump in. Very quickly. Um, when we were developing the, and I don't expect everybody to have this committed to memory, but we were developing the goals toward the late end of the late uh, late summer, um, you know, early fall. Um, one of the final goals that came in was related to uh, strategic objective number three, which is around, uh, you know, the buildings and maintenance and things of that nature. And that goal has everything to do with a robust outreach plan uh, related to this project so that might be more uh me in partnership with the building committee um than uh, mr donovan yeah and i'll just add on to that member Cassianos. um it's a great question and i think it's, it's certainly a <clears throat> goal for this process that we that we all are going to buy into and, and that we're all going to be part of you know i think you know one of the basic things we're doing is we invited uh, Mr. Donovan here tonight and want to make that a regular feature of our meetings to have updates to, to, to this group and therefore to the to the public. Um, uh, we we have, as Mr. Donovan said, a, a, a uh, relatively large school building committee that whose help we're going to ask in, in, in uh, getting the word out and also bringing the community input of which uh, yourself, Member Castellano, Member Gately are, are, are a part. Um, and uh, we're, we're certainly going to be asking the, the committee's help, and 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 uh, I know Dr. Tellweiler has been thinking and working on that as well, and uh, on behalf of him and his team. So it's certainly uh, going to be up to all of us to to make this a, a really proactive and communicative process, and we're 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 aiming to start that from the from the very beginning. Um, I think we I had member Gately, and then uh, member Magnolia. Okay. Um, Mr. Donovan, I am the building and ground chair, so I'm going to be working with you. Um, I'd like to be optimistic and I want to go over the timeline for Thurgood Marshall because didn't we start that in 2013? We did. And did no, 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 no. We started that in 2009, nine or 10, oh, I believe. 2009. And, and there was a, there was a lengthy pause on the Thurgood Marshall, uh, study hmm. between the feasibility and moving forward. Um, having to do with uh, construction projects across the state, nothing to do with the city, but it had to do with the MSBA and, and some things outside the cities. We, we opened the school in 16, we started construction in early 15, we were <coughs> 2011, 12, I believe, the feasibility. And, and so it, it, there was a pause, otherwise it would have been five years. Okay, because I did notice um, that we opened it in April. Yes. And it was like a pleasant surprise to the community that we opened that building in April and they all went from the old Third Marshall into the brand new building, correct? It was, it was uh, as smooth a transition as it could be. Let's and that's that what way. I'm hoping for in the Pickering project. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Member Magnolia, yeah. Um, so out of curiosity, for those who don't know, um, Pickering is attached to Sisson. Um, so we've got an elementary school and a middle school kind of joined at the hip, joined at the gym, literally. Um, obviously, if the plans that go forth are a reno, a reno, or an addition, that has to address Sisson because Sisson is attached to it. But if there's a new building that is chosen, 
um, a new building site altogether, what happens to the part of Sisson that's Pickering, if you know what I mean? Because it's, it's, it's hard to separate out how those two are, it's like a parasite. Oh, I, I'm not trying to be macabre, but I mean, the way they're stuck together is, is unique. How about that? Well, part of the MSBA uh, requirements are that you study your rehab, and then you study your rehab in addition, they make you go through the exercise. Uh, looking at it, it may, the first time it didn't make sense. It, if it didn't make sense, then it probably doesn't make sense now. But you have to go through, develop the cost, how you would look at it, what the layout would be. We did that. So we know the best we can do. Uh, again, that's somewhere we, we should be able to save uh, funding because we know what, uh, if we did an addition, where it would go because of all the constraints around that. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day, if we, if we build a new building and it's located somewhere and the students move out, to that new building, it'll be up to the school committee to decide what to do with the remaining building. You, you, you would have a building that's partially built in 1905, it added it on in 1953. It's not suitable as a middle school. That does not mean that you could not use it as an elementary school. You could not use it as an early childhood center. You could not use it for other school means that, but right now it doesn't, is not suited as a middle school. And that's why we're going through the exercise we are right now. So what you're saying is that the, the sort of, I'll call it the Sisson problem, if we choose a new site, would kind of be a, a whole separate other issue because of the fact that we've chosen another site. So what to do with how those two things are attached is kind of a new project. Is, is that my understanding of what you're saying? Well, I, I, I'm afraid I'm not understanding the question. I, I don't, I haven't been made aware of a problem with the way that they're, I mean, that layout came from 1953 when they put those two additions onto the building. Um, the school department, the school committee could choose to use the cafeteria and the gymnasium as part of Sisson if they wanted to and make the rest office. It would, the world is, is yours at that point. It's still a building that's in the control of the school committee and under the school departments to do so. I, funding available you could do with it what you want I understand I think what um, we here's where the disconnect is is that that gym and that cafeteria is called Pickering it's not called Sisson so I think what you're talking about that space that Sisson could use it, it's just called Pickering it's not called part of the the Sisson like it's called the Pickering gym not the Sisson gym even though it's in that 53 oh. part so I think I understand what you're saying which is that it it could go back to Sisson or be part of Sisson if that was the decision of the, the committee. It's, it's just, it's very strange how, how things are delineated within that building, common usage versus technicalities in terms of how old things are, are and when they were built. I think that's just an artificial construct. And that now I get that, about. thank you. Mm -hmm. You've illuminated that for me, I appreciate it. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Donovan, for the update. Thank you, Mr. Donovan. Thank you, Mr. Donovan. Thank, thank you, you Mr. Much. Donovan. Have a good evening, everybody. You too. You too, you too as well. All right, so the next item on the agenda is the request to accept donations from the Marblehead Municipal Employees Union and power up of sports equipment, musical instruments, and art supplies. Uh, what's the recommendation, Superintendent? Recommendation is uh, for the school committee to support uh, that donation. Great. I'll make a motion to accept that. A second. Roll call, please. Member Castellanos? Yes. Member Coppola? Yes. Member Dugan? Yes. Member Gailey? Yes. Member Magnolia? Yes. Member Pena? Yes. Member yes. Nicholson? Yes. Next item is request to accept donation from the Curtin family who are proud to make the donation to fund loaner instruments in memory of their mother, Shirley Curtin, a longtime band parent and supporter of the arts in the Lynn Public School System. Recommendation of the superintendent? Uh, the recommendation would be to support this uh, wonderful donation. Second. Motion to accept. Second. second. Motion made. Second and roll call, please. Member Castellanos? Yes. Member Coppola? Yes. Member Dugan? Yes. Member Gately? Yes. Member Magnolia? Yes. Member Pena? Yes. Mayor Nicholson? Yes. Next item, Lynn Teachers Union requests permission to continue the practice of presenting awards to deserving students in the graduating classes of the middle and senior high schools. Superintendent? Uh, once again, uh, seeking uh, the school committee's uh, support of uh, this wonderful uh, collaboration with uh, the Lynn Teachers Union uh, celebrating deserving students in middle and high. Motion, Motion to accept. accept. Second. Second. Made and seconded. Roll call, please. 
Member Castellanos? Yes. Member Coppola? Yes. Member Dugan? Yes. Member Gately? Yes. Member Magnolia? Yes. Member Pena? Yes. Mayor Nicholson? Yes. Thank you for all the generous supporters. All right, next item on the agenda is internet Wi-Fi access at schools. Dr. Magnolia. Thank you very much. Um, I brought this issue to the attention of the committee because I was uh, getting reports from constituents about intermittent access at some of our schools. Um, I brought this to the attention of Dr. Tutwiler, who is going to give us an update on our net network capabilities, but I specifically have two questions. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the questions is about the testing of how reliable the internet is, especially because some of our buildings are quite old. And I'm going to give you an example of that. We found at North Shore Community College that we had an amazing network capability, but we had rooms that did not have that amazing network capability. And it was only the reporting of the folks who were in those rooms that actually found out that the network was slowing down in them. So my first question to you is, um, is there a plan in place specifically to make sure that our, as we upgrade our network, um, there are nooks and crannies that are being covered just as well as main spaces? And this has particularly come to light in English high school. Mm -hmm. And then the second um, question that I wanted to bring up was um, how LPS um, is thinking it might work with the city specifically with regards to ARPA funds for um, home internet use by our students. Um, for those who don't know, um, after the pandemic, remote learning, um, now that students have laptops, a lot more homework assignments, even in the elementary grades, require the use of internet at home. But currently, not all of our Lynn Public School students have internet at home. If any of you have been at the Lynn Public Library, as soon as school gets out, you will see that children's department just overrun with kids who all sit down with either their laptops or the computers at the school uh, that the library has to do homework first. In fact, the librarians are amazing there just trying to make sure that the students do their homework before they play, right? Um, so I'm hoping that LPS is working with the city to think about how we can make sure that there is internet access for our students at home since the sort of stopgap measure of those hot spots, which was in the beginning of the pandemic, we know that some of the, that funding specifically ran out. So that's the nature of my questions. Thank you. Thank you for the questions and the, uh, the opportunity to, to talk about this. I think in your uh, packets, there's a uh, bullet point uh, list. Uh, with some information, uh, if, if it's not, then I'm going to talk through it. Um, so, uh, and, no. you know, this is a topic that has been, that's come up a number of times um, since the beginning of the school year. If you go back to last year, um, just quickly, you know that um, the number of devices, uh, you know, went up exponentially to meet the needs of students, uh, to help staff support the learning needs uh, of students. Um, but what we didn't have, uh, obviously, uh, was uh, a foundation for supporting that increase of devices on site in our schools. I and mean, we had uh, what we thought or what was believed to be enough given the devices that we had. And by the way, uh, when the pandemic hit, we had uh, approximately 10,000 um, devices and not all of them were portable. Some of them were desktops and things of that nature. Now every student has one, every staff member has one. So completely different scenario. With that reality in mind, uh, the IT team um, had the foresight to work with Verizon to increase uh, the bandwidth uh, more than double than what we had uh, pre-pandemic. Um, that order was placed uh, late spring last year in April uh, with a confirmation uh, and an expectation of delivery by June, which we were excited about. So, like, we can actually test this out uh, before we go into the summer. That didn't happen. Uh, and then became the waiting game, uh, which I you know, believe people experience in many facets of their lives uh, during the pandemic, uh, supply chain shortages, things of that nature. Um, and uh, the problem is we had all the devices and people were using them enthusiastically. Uh, we have staff that have embraced the blended learning model wholeheartedly um, and which we're excited about, but 
the system that we had across the district and schools just wasn't equipped to accommodate that kind of use, uh, both the number end of devices and the type of use, right? The streaming, there's videos. Um, and so uh, we consistently communicated to principals to limit, um, you know, high bandwidth activities, st streaming, videos, um, you know, where possible. Uh, but what resulted, uh, quite frankly, frequently across the schools was, um, you know, access issues, um, either an inability to access uh, altogether or you get the spinning wheel uh, or kicked out of programs, things of that nature. Uh, in this uh, timeline, which I will make sure that you get, um, does outline some additional challenges that we uh, experienced over the course, some of them, none, you know, not our fault, but just uh, things that happen uh, in the course of uh, daily events that, that made, uh, that exacerbated uh, the access issue. Um, now we're in a, a much better place, actually very recently, uh, January 17th, um, Verizon uh, finally was able to install one of two circuits, even with the one circuit, we had significantly more than we had last year. Uh, and on that date, six schools were moved over to the new circuit, Hood, Lynn Woods, Washington, Aborn, English, Lynn Tech, uh, the annex at Lynn Tech, they were all moved over. Uh, and that was done uh, intentionally to kind of, you know, go slow to go fast, right? We want to make sure that we test everything out, make sure it's working instead of flipping a switch and then having everybody experience more issues uh, than they already were. And I also should mention that the IT team, IT team um, did uh, what they call a load balancing um, strategy to sort of make the day-to-day -day experience better. We, we are, were able to... Um, successfully administer all of the um, uh, MCAS retakes at the high school level. Um, we are uh, getting close to the end of um, access testing, which has gone smoothly at all of our schools. And we think that has a lot to do with uh, the load uh, balancing. But that's not to say that there weren't still issues. They were just a lot less. Uh, but in any case, the 17th, we had six schools moving on to the new circuit. Um, and then uh, this week, uh, we moved six more schools on, uh, Harrington, Tracy, Cobbett, Callahan, Druitts, and Fallon. Uh, the first uh, switch over to the new network went really well. Uh, the second uh, to my, uh, it's reported, has gone uh, really well. And so with that, there'll be an assessment tomorrow with the hopes of moving the remaining schools onto the new circuit. Uh, and what we hope will be uh, a far more, uh, a far better experience as it relates to access. Um, those ports, actually, you can see uh, right there two things. Uh, one, uh, new ports were purchased uh, and were installed across the district. I think that's the right name for those yeah. things yeah. right there that actually say Aruba on it, and every time I look at it, <laughs> I think of Aruba, because <laughs> I'm not there, <laughs> and it, it, would, it would be nice. But uh, those were installed, and additionally, we have uh, a new firewall, uh, and IT has been slowly, um, you know, turning that firewall on, testing, asking schools to test the applications that they use most frequently. I mean, we have, uh, you know, knock on wood, not a lot, but some issues with cer certain applications, which they're able to rectify uh, pretty quickly in that with that new firewall. Uh, but so far, it's gone really, really smoothly. Um, English High School uh, has, you know, like many schools, experienced uh, challenges. Uh, part of the solution exists in reporting, right? Mm -hmm. So, where is the problem? Well, when I go over here, uh, I, I have no connection, or I'm in this corner of the room, I have no connection. They have a tech on site full time uh, who can support uh, addressing those issues. Uh, you know, recently, and I just spoke to the principal uh, about it, uh, about this, uh, in the morning in particular, there's some challenges, and that has a lot to do with. Uh, the vol well, actually, we got an expert right here. <laughs> you can tell us. Uh, um, but uh, a lot of students, a lot of teachers logging on and sort of firing things up, which 
causes some slowdowns, but we suspect in the coming days they'll be able to rectify that. Uh, and as far as a sort of general like uh, oversight, is it, are things working? You know, where are the hangups? Um, IT has a pretty robust uh, system. Uh, that, that you know churns out data, the reports. You can see where the hang up hang ups are, and that, that process is what they use to load balance uh, before we got onto the new circuits. Uh, they are watching that closely because they desperately want to make sure that this works well, because they know that kids' experience uh, is impacted uh, by this. So I apologize, this is not in your packet, but I'll make sure that you get that. It's just a, a timeline uh, of the events uh, over the, uh, since the beginning of the school year. Uh, At-home Wi-Fi access is extremely important because uh, as you said, and I agree, there is more, uh, a, a higher expectation around access beyond the school day. Last year, um, we started with a partnership with Comcast to provide in-home Wi-Fi setups. Uh, we've since, since moved to um, T-Mobile, uh, which provides a hotspot that looks uh, a lot like this. Uh, we still have those, uh, and there are about 350 of those uh, out in force right now. Um, you know, we really rely on staff uh, in partnership with either a social worker, to, um, you know, students say, ah, I can get my homework done because we don't have Wi-Fi at home, great. Uh, you know, that person, that teacher relays that to the principal or social worker, and then we can get a hotspot for that student at home. So we still have those, uh, and we've got, we've got plenty of them, and certainly uh, provide that wherever the need is. Um, and I suspect that that will just be an enduring, you know, uh, supply uh, that we keep because th th this is not going away. Thank you. How was the internet in English today? I have to ask. Be honest. Now he just took a deep breath. So that, that, <laughs> now, I'm wor now I'm worried. <laughs> um, it's definitely internet. Um, yep. <laughs> Not the best. Yep. Um, I know there's been occasions where lesson plans had to be postponed sure. or assigned sure. at home. Yep. And I remember this Monday, actually, yep. in my Spanish class, we had to wait 30 minutes for a presentation to load up uh, just to start the class. Yep. So it's like almost a waste of valuable time totally and mm. it puts more pressure on the students because we're still expected to complete the assignments of the day so we won't fall behind yeah 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 i appreciate that um that insight and i'll say this that's one of the tragic pieces of it certainly uh the student experience you're wasting your time uh your time and the teacher's time uh, the worry also uh, is, uh, and I remember, you know, technology wasn't as big a deal when I was a teacher, uh, but people would try things from time to time. And if the internet didn't work, like, I'm just not going to do that anymore. I'm just going to stick with what I know uh, will happen uh, or what I know can, you know, will work. And if that's not going to work consistently, I'm just not going to do it. Uh, and so it's really up to us to make sure that there's reliable you know, speedy internet every day so that you don't have that experience. Appreciate you sharing. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I remember doing. Uh, yeah, sure. So Dr. Tutwiler, uh, correct me if I heard this wrong. Did, did you say on January 17th, Verizon installed one of two circuits? Yes. So is, the, is there a date for the second one or? Um, I, well, you know what? I would say one, but <laughs> okay. Who knows? No, no, no. You know what I mean? No, like I we thought that. we were going to have this last June, yeah, and so right. we were really careful not to promise that the other, Absolutely. you know. But um, I will tell you this: we had we're going from um, seven gigabytes to twenty. Okay. So it's a significant, and I'm told that the consultants that we're working with were like, "You guys are going to have no problem uh, once these things are in place." Even with the one, right. uh, that's a significant increase. But we. We went the distance, so. Okay. Great, thank you. Really don't want to have that kind of experience happening. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Member Gailey. Any idea when that second circuit is coming? Are you joking? <laughs> 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 I'm only saying that, Lorraine, because he just asked me that. Oh. Uh, I, 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 <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I was they, to my they, they, for a minute. 
They promise, uh, but you know, we, yeah, we'll believe it when it's there. Mr. McHugh, I don't know if you've heard anything different. <laughs> I think they're holding up on another pot. They're waiting on another pot right now. They were in. They were on site this week, three days, and. They've been back and forth, and now they're missing a part. So um, we're hoping soon. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, Member Magnolia, just in, in terms of the the um, ARPA funding, I think uh, w w wanted to mention that the, the that broadband access is absolutely one of the categories. You know, there, there's a, uh, approved categories for the ARPA spending. Um, of, of course, we want to be complementing what we're doing in the in the Lynn public schools, um, and I think there's some. There's some analysis and thinking to do about what what that means in our community, the way they've defined some of that, um, uh, because obviously different communities across the country experience that in different ways. Uh, but but certainly one of the project areas, and would encourage uh, folks we've been working with the, with the Lynn City Council um, on coming up with a process for that, um, and and recently uh, launched a website lynnarpa.com for people to uh, keep tabs of, of, of have that process, participate in that process of setting the priorities. Um, and uh, w th there will be a, a really uh, robust outreach effort and in input um, over the course of the next several months to, to uh, work our way through those uh, uh, plans for the Lynn Arbor funds. All right. Uh, request to temporarily suspend attendance standard. Yeah, um, this evening I'm seeking the committee's uh, support and approval to um, suspend uh, a particular piece of our attendance policy. Uh, you'll recall two years ago, uh, two and a half years ago, uh, school committee, uh, school administration, principals, teachers, and even students uh, all sort of came together in a sort of organized fashion uh, to create uh, a new attendance policy that um, uh, I think reflects our values, uh, both high expectations, but then also, you know, an opportunity for students to, you know, turn things around and uh, have a second chance. Um, and uh, while I would say that I really believe in that attendance policy, I'd also say that it was developed at a time uh, very different from where we are right now. and. Uh, I think one of the things that I've really appreciated um, and um, y you know admire about uh, the school committee and uh, administration working uh, in partnership is our ability to uh, make changes and be flexible and understand uh, the times. And right now, I mean, you received a uh, memo from me, I believe, last Friday. I, this one I know you have in there. Uh, and I laid out uh, sort of clearly uh, what the policy, policy JH, uh, says about attendance. Uh, and then I also laid out for you at the secondary level the significant change in the average daily attendance for middle and high school. Uh, it is lower uh, to the tune of 7% uh, at the middle school level and 8% uh, uh, at the high school level. Uh, that's significant. And when we compare quarter two uh, that we're almost uh, nearing the end of and um, quarter two during the last uh, in-person experience that we had, which was the year before last. It's pretty significant. And, you know, knowing what we do about mental health and where students are, we, we don't think it's appropriate um, for scenarios where students have uh, more than uh, four unexcused absences for their grades to be automatically a D minus. We think they should get the grade that they earned. Um, because uh, a lot of these absences are anchored in fear. Uh, they're anchored, obviously, in illness. Uh, they're anchored in, you know, uh, extenuating circumstances. Uh, and I think we need to recognize that and allow students the grades that they earned this quarter. And so at the end of this memo, there are two asks. Uh, I'll read them. Uh, allow schools the flexibility to allow students to receive the actual grade that they earned during quarter two, even if they exceeded four unexcused absences. That's the first ask. The second ask, because this policy was in place first quarter, allow students who did not meet the attendance standard for quarter one to receive the grade that they 
the grade earned, mm -hmm. uh, whether or not they met the attendance standard during quarter two, meaning uh, the policy says that a student cannot exceed three unexcused absences uh, if they did not meet the standard the previous quarter uh, in order to turn those grades from a D minus into whatever they actually earned. So I'm asking for those two things for this quarter only. Um, uh, we would return to our uh, to the policy for for quarter three. Um, you know, you, you you've received updates from me about the direction of the positive cases. It is trending down rapidly, which we are really thankful for. So we're hopeful um that you know we won't see this kind of attendance uh issue in quarter three but if we do i might be coming right back before you but for quarter two we think this is an important thing uh for our middle and high school students make a motion to approve yes. i second. second motion made and seconded uh yeah member magnolia yeah can i just ask a quick question about um quarter three right I think the pandemic has taught us that none of us can predict the future to <laughs> here, any here. reliability. Yeah. Um, is there wisdom in proactively doing this for quarter three for a very specific reason, which is that persistence rate near the end of high school for somebody who sees that they're earning a D just because of, you know, parents keep them home. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily in their control if there is an exposure to illness, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of the students that come to see me thinking they did not earn good grades, yep. right? Yep. Um, and I know you can't do this just for students in this specific position, but it, because of the way you've worded this, it's the grade that they've earned not knocked down by the attendance policy. Correct. And, and, and I would think that the goodwill of allowing students for this academic year to get the grade they earned, not looking at the attendance policy, would help with persistence rates. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you see what I'm saying? I do. Mm -hmm. So there's a uh, motion made and seconded. The, uh, whoever put forward the motion could accept a friendly amendment if they're so Absolutely. Inclined. Okay. I think it's fair. Okay. I would like to make a friendly amendment friendly amendment to the motion to extend this to quarter three second second okay Is there any perspective Can I just say thank you <laughs> yeah <laughs> i have That's lots what, of conversations yeah. with the yeah. secondary principals and um they have asked and pleaded mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. us to try and get this through mm -hmm. uh because they see in their buildings mm -hmm. the effects mm -hmm. of the pandemic and how the kids are having difficulty surviving with their grades. Mm -hmm. And it's not that the kids aren't trying. There's just a yeah. lot of circumstances that yeah. are getting in That's the right. way and this right. will, they will be thrilled to hear this. Great. Well, Great. Quarter three, how about quarter four? <laughs> I know, I called the whole year. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Hey, I would no. like to revise my friendly <laughs> amendment to the motion to extend it for the academic year 2020, 2021, 2022. I second that. Yep. Okay. Um, I, I think as a friendly amendment, we can just vote on the uh, amendment, uh, the motion as amended. Uh, so roll call, please. Yes. Member Coppola? Yes. Member Dugan? Yes. Member Gailey? Yes. Member Magnolia? Yes. Member Pena? Yes. Mayor Nicholson? Yes. All right. Thank so, you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, next item is vote to approve appoint school committee attorney. Um, oh. Secretary of uh, school committee, Mary Julius, has a, a list of the um, firms. Yeah, if that's, I think, uh, just to give uh, everyone a moment to collect their thoughts and also to uh, put that in front of us. Um, I'll say a couple words about how I uh, imagine us moving forward. Uh, obviously, <clears throat> we are in dire need of a, a school committee attorney uh, for, for, for many reasons, many of the business items of the Lynn Public Schools. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we had talked when we spoke about aiming to move forward this evening, uh, having interviewed all of the candidates who applied and accepted an interview. Um, and uh, 
the best way to be doing that? Well, for one, because this is uh, uh, all to be done in, in regular meeting that, that we're doing it um, in the regular meeting uh, with consultation from our interim uh, legal counsel in the city solicitor's office. And uh, so uh, wanted to give folks an opportunity to share their, their thoughts and questions um, to, be, to be done clearly in, in, in open meeting. And then, uh, you know, w once people have had a chance to share their observations, reflections to the extent that they would like uh, to ask folks to put forward their first choice uh, and uh, to see where that takes us. Obviously, if there are four of us who have the same first choice, then that person would be hired um, or extended an offer. And then if on that first go around there is not a uh, candidate that receives four votes, then we would have another round of voting with either the top two or in the event of a tie more than that um, until and, and, and so on and so forth until we get to a uh, candidate that receives four votes. All right, so uh, we, we can start just by opening them up if anybody wants to start to share their uh, reflections and uh, yeah, Member Dugan. Sure, uh, so at this time, could I speak on behalf of who I feel? Sure. Okay, um, so I just wanna speak on behalf of uh, Attorney Phelan. Um, with this one, I, I feel like I need to go with my gut and my gut is telling me that uh, we need somebody who is there and according to Attorney Phelan, he, this will be his one client, Lynn School Department. Um, it is true that he doesn't have, uh, you know, the resume that I think some of the other people may have or some of the other firms may have. But uh, I, I just, like I said, I, I feel like, um, you know, he's, he's gonna be there uh, as our attorney. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, his experience on the Lynn School Committee, on the city council, um, he understands what the needs of the city are and the landscape of the city. Um, according to his resume and, you know, what he expressed to us, he's had experience with labor law with uh, Holyoke and Springfield. Um, and I feel like uh, he's, you know, just from listening to him, uh, one of the things that I think is really important is a relationship with our attorney and the trust of our attorney. Uh, and I feel like that that's what he uh, expressed to us and that we would be able to do that. Um, and that Dr. Totweiler would be able to, uh, you know, have a very uh, collegial relationship with him that, that he could feel comfortable with too. And I think Attorney Phelan also expressed some passion uh, in his interview, which, uh, which really impressed me. So uh, that's how I feel. Um, and uh, I appreciate everybody listening. Thank you, Member Dugan, Member Magnolia. I have a question regarding special education services. Okay, so a number of the firms um, and individuals said that they did not do special education. In fact, KP Law specifically mentioned um, that we have currently special ed counsel Katie Meinholt. Um, is there an issue with hiring a school committee attorney that does not do special ed and retaining special ed counsel Katie Meinholt or is there a, a conflict with this? I don't understand how the special ed is separate from or included in the needs of the school committee attorney. So can someone explain that to me, please? Yeah, that's right. You want to you speak to what we're doing now and how we're imagining that? Yeah. Yeah. So um, since I've been here, uh, so for seven years, um, the district has always had um, a partnership with a different firm uh, or individual who's provided special education uh, support. Um, that individual for us now is uh, Katie Meinolt and she does an incredible job. Uh, she's in a very small firm. I think it's just her and one other attorney. Uh, very accessible, very knowledgeable and uh, the special education team, uh, you know, they love her. And I, I think she does incredible work. And so um, the vast majority or, or all of the special ed matters um, would were handled by that uh, by the firm or by Katie more recently. Um, and if there was any matter that came close to uh, something that our, our previous attorney uh, handled, there would be a partnership or they'd work together on it. Um, but uh, it, it is a very, you know, specialized area and you want somebody who, you know, exclusively does that, not a whole bunch of other things. And so whoever, whoever selected uh, w would have very little um, special education work. Okay. 
It was one of the interview questions. So that's why I needed to understand why we were asking the question if we also had retained an attorney that was specializing in this. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, ju and just to clarify itself, that, that interview question mentioned other sort of yes. general, right? Yeah. So um, I think we, I think it's helpful to have someone with some facility because you want to know when to call mm -hmm. the specialist, um, but, but certainly agree with Dr. Tutwiler in terms of that approach. Can, can I advocate now or was my time up with my question? <laughs> Please go ahead. Okay, um, I, I would like to advocate for the firm of Miaris and Harrington, which was the lawyers uh, Donna Brewster and Alexandra Rubin that presented to us. Um, I really felt that the incredible depth of expertise um, that uh, Donna Brewer expressed to us is something that can take the school committee and Lynn Public Schools forward. Um, the amount of training and information that she mentioned she pushes out regularly through newsletters and e-blasts, as well as um, Attorney Rubin's experience uh, directly with um, pandemic issues said something to me about our ability to rely on that expertise for the future of how we build much more resilient schools. Thank you. Member Magnolia, mm. Member Coppola. Okay, um, I think we had some uh, nice groups that came before us, but I also feel as though um, we have to really pick somebody that does have um, urban school experience because it's definitely um, a little different and although um, I know attorney Phelan is local um, hiring somebody with no experience at this is is kind of difficult um, some of some of what I think um, that we need is not um, you know trainings and such it's actual you know hit the ground and help the superintendent or the committee with issues that um, come before us. And, um, you know, some of these may be a better fit for other communities, but not necessarily a fit for us. Um, I personally had liked either Howard Greenspan or I thought that the Norris Murray and Pelican was, um, would be a good match, but um, you know, my preference is somebody who is closer to Lynn and, um, you know, maybe it's my own, own preference because, uh, I think to attorney my house and it was a good relationship with one individual and, um, you know, I just thought maybe Greenspan might do that for us. And the other thing is it doesn't, you know, if we pick somebody and it doesn't appear to be a good fit after an amount of time. Um, you know, there's, there's, uh, we can, you know, move on with another process. But we had um, Attorney Myhouse for like 30 years. I think he was here, and that's that's a long, long time. So, for us, um, you know, we may be trying to work something out. But um, I'd like to hear what the superintendent has to say. If, he had thought any of them would be a fit that he could work with. Thank you, uh, Member Capola, Dr. Tutwiler. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I'll uh, echo uh, what Eric said around collegiality. Uh, I can work with anybody. Um, you know, I, all of the um, attorneys brought, um, I thought, uh, expertise. Um, you know, some uh, experience uh, with urban uh, settings. Um, but then I'd also like to channel, uh, Member Coppola, what you said about relationships. Because uh, I think about uh, in my short tenure as superintendent uh, and the relationship that I had with John Myhos, I mean, there was a daily conversation, uh, especially as the pandemic uh, began to rage, uh, and I needed him to be available, and, they, and I couldn't wait until later on in the day, and I, need, I, I needed, if I had questions, I needed him to be available for me right away, and I was um, kind of expecting uh, an answer or support. Um, and so, you know, the good news is, uh, you know, we, we, 
we live in Massachusetts, not Texas. It's a small state. Uh, all of these folks are in Eastern Mass, and you know people talk. And uh, the, these uh, attorneys, many of them, are representing districts, superintendents. I know, uh, and um, I, you know, it, through the interview, felt uh, the most connection uh, with Attorney Green, Greenspan, uh, and I also, boy, this is. Donna, this is we're, we're agreeing. This is amazing. Yeah. This is I also I, I also liked uh, <laughs> this is the Kodak moment right here. Uh, Norris uh, Murray and Peloquin. Um, but but I but I want to be clear. Whoever selected, uh, I I will work with, and we will we will do we will do well. So uh, anyone else uh, have thoughts or questions? Yeah, Member Cassianos. <laughs> Where do I start? So we had a very uh, thorough process. I want to thank, first of all, George Markopoulos was instrumental during the summertime. It's been a, you know, the tragedy that we had to endure with the loss of John uh, definitely impacted a lot of us, um, not just professionally, but personally. This has been a really, um, difficult process, but a very necessary process, uh, seeking counsel. Uh, I also want to thank the previous mayor for taking time. I know we, we all met in the previous uh, year to discuss this need that we're trying to address. Um, went through, you know, all the candidates, uh, went through the packets. We, you know, we got to shift through different firms and kind of see what everyone's preferences are. Um, you know, for myself, as a, as the chairman of negotiations, you know, I, I was wearing that lens as we were proceeding with interviews and just doing this process, and I and and I all and I, I kept on thinking of how can I, you know, I try to vision myself with each of the candidates and firms to see which one would be you know my best fit, um, and the standout for me uh, was Attorney Fallon for me, um, his accessibility, um, and based off his skills and years of experience in municipal government. Uh, labor relations and this commitment to us really stood out to me. Um, it was very important in my transition as a school committee member to have attorney my house at my my every phone call anytime I need to reach out to him. That was very important to um, establish. Uh, I know they all re uh, mentioned relationships mm -hmm. um, and building the, that knowledge base that we need. Um, and his, you know, that that that's. A lot of those attorneys are skilled. That's a very, we are in a very difficult conversation. This is a very difficult um, uh, decision that we all have to make tonight. Um, and I just really, I really strongly st I recommend folks really take a look at Attorney Phelan um, and what he has to offer and what, what type of really, what his commitment. Um, he's not just um, making a couple priorities for us. It sounds like he's going to be all in, and I think that's very important to note. So... Member Gailey. I, um, I didn't want to select from the last group. So we had another group of um, applicants and we reposted. I um, went around the city and I said, why can't we find someone from Lynn that knows the city charter, that's familiar with our in-laws and when Tim Phelan decided to apply, he met those criteria. He also had experience on the school committee. He had experience working hand to hand or hand in hand with John Myos through negotiations. So I think that I would feel comfortable with Tim Phelan as my lawyer for the school committee. And that's my reasoning. So I would like Tim Failing. Great. Um, so, you know, I think I will also weigh in. I think these are, these are uh, you know, somewhat difficult conversations because typically interviews do not happen in the, in the public eye with, with the yeah. candidates um, participating. So I appreciate everyone's uh, uh, sort of uh, willingness to participate in that. Uh, I think we're, we're, we're also, you know, to echo, I think what Member Dugan said and Dr. Tower echoed, we're, we're all going to work with whoever the person is, right? Like that's definitely how we, we work as a, as a committee and, and uh, in, in, in local government. Um, and I think there were some really uh, compelling candidacies here. Um, so 
I think that's that 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 that's great with a lot of strengths um, brought to the table. I think for for personally, uh, for me, I I feel like uh, it's important to have someone in this role that has done this work previously, that has experience uh, representing school committees in urban districts. Um, I think it's a it's a very um, specific technical area of the law, um, and uh, I think that there there's a lot of folks around the table um, that can help us bring the different aspects um, that you know the, the the terms of the particulars of the community the relationships the personality um, but we, we we currently do not have the table is expertise um, on these specific areas of law that are before us um, and then so uh, for that reason that was one of the my what what I prioritized in, in reading the applications and listening to the interviews and particularly in uh, experience in urban districts because um, those that that tells me that they've had experience on questions that are likely to come up on the issues that are that, that we're going to be coming up with um, so uh, that, that that was what I was looking for and I thought that um, Howard Greenspan had that uh, going that, that had that experience that he had um, done that, that done this job for urban districts um, because uh, uh, you know he, he, he's been in that role I think hearing my colleagues go through this process uh, one of the things that I think people were really nervous about was accessibility to the attorney and I think there are some of the larger firms that had the experience that I was looking for in terms of urban experience with the district um, but but wanting to sort of hear that feedback and and think about people that uh, would be able to sort of uh, take the legal experience that they had and expertise they had and be able to relate it in a way. I mean, there's no replacing uh, John my house, right? There's just an impossible task, but for someone to, to take over that job, because somebody has to do it, right? Um, and thinking about someone who can act in that uh, as, as an individual um, that people can feel comfortable building a relationship with that has that local connection, but that also has experience doing this exact job in districts that are comparable to Lynn. Um, so, and also, you know, I think I appreciate Dr. Um, uh, Member Coppola asking Dr. Tutwiler for his recommendation and thoughts um, because Dr. Tutwiler is going to be working with him so closely, and I think that's really important. Um, and so, that also uh, uh, means a lot to me. So, does anyone have any other questions or thoughts, or should we? Well, I just wanted to add yeah, a little Member Pena, please. Um, a lot of. Uh, we had, a, you know, we interviewed. We had a, you know, a thorough process, and uh, we had a lot of great candidates. Uh, Mr. Phelan stuck out with me because uh, he's a Lynn guy. He's local, you know. Um, he his accessibility, but also I just want to touch on Greenspan's experience. That you know, we want we want someone that's kind of been doing this. So I'm kind of that's where I'm at with this limo. I do like a local guy, someone who's going to be accessible, who's going to be available. You know, at a you know drop of a dime, we're facing a lot of issues. You know, we're I'm a, you know we're in, we've got negotiations coming up, and those things are important. But it's also important to have someone who's been practicing, you know, at, you know having this actual experience, you know, which is very key to what's going on. Um, thank you for reminding me. You know, Mass is a small state. <laughs> <laughs> no accessibility is not. You know, we're we're living at different times. Right, you know, right. and, Five but, miles uh, instead of three miles away. But it's very it's, accessibility is key, you know, and, and uh, right. those those things are very important and key, you know, uh, and um, that's where I'm at. It was, uh, okay, I just want to touch upon that. Okay. Other thoughts or questions? I would just add that I can be persuaded that that Greenspan is is a good choice for us. I, I think I had about four top people. So it was very hard. Mm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Wonderful, well, that's helpful. Um, should, if no one has any other comments, I think we can call a roll and ask people to uh, submit their selection and then we'll see um, where that gets us in terms of, of votes, if that's okay. All right, absolutely. roll call, please. Member Castellanos. Attorney Timothy Phelan. Member Coppola. Howard Greenspan. 
Member Dugan? Attorney Timothy Phelan. Member Gately? Attorney Timothy Phelan. Member Magnolia? Attorney Howard Greenspan. Member Pena? <laughs> Attorney Greenspan. Mayor Nicholson? Attorney Howard Greenspan. All right, uh, so that. That's it? As I counted, four votes for Attorney Howard Greenspan, so uh, we will reach out to him um, and uh, appreciate everyone's help throughout this process. I would echo Member Cassianos in thanking um, Attorney Markopoulos for his help throughout mm -hmm. uh, over the last uh, months. And uh, thank you to all of you for this, um, for going through this process and also for the moving with the speed that we did, um, understanding how uh, important this was to the district that we fill this role. So thank you all so much. And then the last item is the superintendent's report. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a couple of things to share. Uh, typically with the onset of the new calendar year, we ramp up plans and activities related to preparing for the following school year. The significant piece of this effort is wrapped up in the development of the budget, which as you know is underway. Therein reflects deep thought, data analysis, and soliciting input on positions, programs, and resources, all in an effort to serve student need. Plans and activities can also involve updates to curriculum and program expansions. I'm using the space of the report this time to share uh, three significant efforts. Last spring, as I shared with you, the Lynn Public Schools was the recipient of a $208,000 grant to support culturally responsive literacy in the district under the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education Growing Literacy Across Massachusetts, or GLEAM, initiative. GLEAM grants will support districts in sub implementing deep and lasting improvements in programming in ELA and slash literacy through a multi-tiered system of support. The effort to improve literacy through equitable practice is supported through a partnership with both DESI and our consultants from the Hill for Literacy. In tandem with these consultancies, our charge is to adopt a new core curriculum for our Tier 1 ELA instruction at the elementary level. Presently, a Curriculum Council Adoption Committee is being formed who will support the process of evaluating and selecting new core curriculum. Key stakeholders from each elementary school will be represented on the team, including grade level teachers as well as ESL specialists and special education teachers. We're excited about this opportunity, very excited actually. As the effort progresses, I'll update you via report with plans for a formal presentation to the curriculum subcommittee when we narrow the selection. A similar effort is happening with elementary mathematics, although not in formal partnership with DESI. During the upcoming months, the math curriculum team will establish a leadership team of representatives from curriculum, English learner education, special education, and elementary teachers from across the district. This team will analyze elementary math curriculum materials through a standards-based and culturally responsive teaching lens using a researched, that should be research, not researched, <laughs> research-based uh, rubric. As part of the selection process, we intend to pilot some of the materials. As we've done historically, we will follow the established adoption procedures approved by the school committee. As is the case for the ELA adoption, uh, we will keep you abreast of our progress. And then finally, last Friday, we submitted a grant application in partnership with North Shore Community College. Our vision is to provide a full-scale, high-impact, immersive college early college experience for Lynn High School students, with the expected outcomes for students to graduate from high school having completed a minimum of 34 credits within four years. For now, we see this as an exciting chance to provide a robust, immersive early college experience for LPS students and deepen our partnership with North Shore Community College. Much more to come on that. Thank you, Dr. Tutwiler. There being no further business before the committee. Motion to adjourn. Second.
Roll call, please. Member Castellanos? Yes. Member Coppola? Yes. Member Dugan? Yes. Member Gately? Yes. Member Magnolia? Yes. Member Pena? Yes. Mayor Nicholson? Yes. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Have fun. Of course.